All right, our last speaker. Uh, so, so any symposium uh, involving dbGaP would be woefully incomplete without someone talking about primary research using dbGaP data. And I was talking to Brian, um, you know, before, when he uh, when he got here, and uh, in addition to threatening to run a little bit over time, he uh, he also told me. Um, you know about moving and storing dbGaP data, and and I was uh, I was telling him about some of the new things we're working on in terms of moving uh, small parts of dbGaP data. And uh, if you're interested in that, check out our webinars. Talk to me. Talk to Eugene Yashenko, who's uh, sitting in the back. That's Eugene back there in that black T-shirt. Yeah. So uh, talk to one one of us uh, or Mike um, at the uh, reception, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you about moving small parts of dbGaP data, and I'd be happy to come to your lab and talk to you about that. So without further ado, uh, here's Brian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, if for no other reason than I, I feel like I've had these, I've known these people from dbGaP for so long via email and via phone. And I actually, this is the first time we've ever met face to face, but it's a real pleasure because I, I think we've been interacting for like five, seven, eight years at this stage. Um, and, and I think that that sort of highlights how long and how uh, important dbGaP has been in my own research and, and how influential it, ha it actually has been. Um, so I, I do promise I'm going to, I know I'm the last speaker, so I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Okay, so I work on a disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is a neurodegenerative disease that is fatal, rapidly fatal. Uh, it's characterized by involvement of both upper and lower motion neurons, which to a neurologist means something, but to everybody else goes, uh, what does that mean? Anyway, I'm not going to explain it too much. But it's actually a disease that's been known for a long, long time, even longer than Alzheimer's disease and Pick's disease, because it was first described by this gentleman here, Jean-Marie Charcot, working in the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris, France. And in fact, in France, it's still known as Charcot's malady, but in America, it's more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease, after famous baseball player who died of the condition. Begs the question, you know, what are the odds of um, Lou Gehrig dying of Lou Gehrig's disease? It's uh, kind of an existential question. Uh, but Lou Gehrig is not the only famous person who died of ALS. Uh, that gentleman there at the top, David Niven, hands up here anybody who knows who David Niven is. Yeah. Now, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Everybody look around. Look at the general age of the individual <laughs> who actually know. <laughs> no young people have put up their hands, right? So let me educate the young people in the audience as to who David Niven was. David Niven was this very famous English Hollywood actor. He was essentially the George Clooney of his time. He actually played 007. Uh, in the original Casino Royale. He's a really great actor, one of my fav personal favorite actors, actually, at the time. He wrote some great books as well, if you're ever interested in autobiographies. But he unfortunately ultimately died of ALS. But he's very um, close to the hearts of many ALS researchers because he actually gave in his will the money that set up the first ALS association, which is the English Association. And in fact, the house where they still hold, or where that association still works, is known as David Niven House in London. Other famous people who um, have died of ALS include Mao Tse Tung, is alleged by one of his uh, physicians to have had uh, ALS in addition to cardiac issues, and Henry Wallace. Anybody know who Henry Wallace is here? Yes? So who is Henry Wallace? He was a politician. He was a vice president. Right? Does anybody know whose vice president he was? No? He was Roosevelt's vice president. And actually, he was replaced on the last ticket, the, the last uh, FDR ticket, by Truman. And of course, Truman got elected that last time, or uh, Roosevelt got elected that last time, and then died 81 days into his, actual, into his actual tenure. So this gentleman here, who actually ultimately died of ALS, well, missed out on being president of the United States by 81 days. Can you imagine how much research dollars we would have got if a president of the United States had actually died of ALS. It's just kind of boggling. So I, I put this slide up here to kind of lighten the mood a little bit because we are talking about a rather fatal neurodegenerative disease. 
But there's also a larger purpose behind um, making these sort of uh, putting up these famous people here, and that is to 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 make the point that everybody kind of has the impression that ALS is a rare neurodegenerative disease. But I will put to you that actually it's not that rare at all. Actually, we can all think of people who you know most people know somebody who's died of ALS. Uh, or knows at least certainly there are reports and we read them in the newspaper of people dying of ALS. Um, but in an attempt to actually do it in a more scientific manner and to put some numbers on that, what we did is we went and we actually tried to calculate how many cases of ALS that there are in the world now and how many ALS cases there are going to be in the world in 2040. And it turns out that there's nearly going to be 400,000 cases of ALS in the world in 2040. And that's actually largely due to the aging of the population. Not that the population is getting bigger, but actually that it's actually aging, a 40, uh, almost a two-thirds increase. And I, I particularly put this slide up here because um, whenever I'm talking to big pharma, because one of our roles when we go out and as researchers talk, um, NIH uh, government employees and uh, trying to work in, uh, on these diseases, we would go out to big pharma, we're trying to get them interested in investing money in trying to research causes and cures for, for these diseases. And the point that the following point that I make to them is, okay, that's 400,000. That's based on the premise that the average life expectancy of an ALS patient is three years. Imagine if you come up with a drug that extends life by one year. That means that you're going to increase your market by one third and so on and so forth. And you can always see in the big farm, whenever you're talking, their eyes sort of light up. And you can see the little dollar signs inside. Because you're literally building your own market with respect to that. And I think that that's actually a very important point, not just with ALS, but with other neurodegenerative diseases. But really, they need to invest in these because they're going to build their own market, much in the same way that they did with multiple sclerosis. So my own area um, of research within ALS has been focused much on the genetics of it and trying to understand what are the ultimate causes of this disease. Uh, and I started, uh, actually, I, I hate to admit it, but I actually started back in 1996. I've been doing this for a long time. And it's, it's kind of crazy. But really, you can see that I, the first gene was found, that was SOD1, back in 1993. And then there was this long, long hiatus until 1996 or before the discovery of the next gene. And I was actually, as I say, I started in the middle of that hiatus. So it was a long sort of gene desert, so to speak, before the next discovery of the next gene. And now I think that you can appreciate from this, from this particular timeline, that really our understanding and our discovery of ALS genetics has shot up ever since. And I think that reflects a number of things. I think that reflects uh, improvements in our technology. I think it reflects improvements in the availability of data that we can download for free and incorporate into our studies in order to increase our power of discovery. Uh, and I think that it also reflects uh, th that blue bit there, that one single gene, which was actually a gene that uh, was discovered in, in, in our lab, uh, namely c 9 orf 72 and that's turned out to be, and I actually used data from dbGaP, uh, and all of that data has subsequently been deposited in dbGaP. Uh, so that, that sort of has really been a sort of a, 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 a pretty landmark discovery within the ALS field, uh, because not only does it account for a large percentage of familial ALS, about 40% of uh, familial ALS, it also accounts for a large percentage of sporadic ALS, which is about 8%, which is great because we were going to all these charitable organizations and our scientific directors saying, give us money because we think that sporadic disease is genetic. Of course, we had no proof. We were spending all of this money in millions and millions, and finally we could go back to them and say, look, truly, it really is a genetic um, uh, disease. Sporadic forms of ALS is truly uh, um, uh, genetic. But not only is it a cause of ALS, but it also is a cause of a similar race in frontotemporal dementia which is another neurodegenerative disease that you would, if you saw two patients, one with ALS and one with frontotemporal dementia, you would think that they're a world apart. There's no way that you would think that these neurodegenerative conditions are the same. And lo and behold, we have one gene, at least, that causes a significant chunk of both of those diseases. So what we're seeing is that basically genetics is paving the path. It's illuminating our understanding of these diseases, and they're bringing these very disparate phenotypes together that we really wouldn't have linked within the clinic ourselves. 
So I think that that was a very exciting um, uh, study. And of course, I, I could actually talk for a long time about this, but I'm not going to because I'm going to be pulled up uh, <laughs> in a few minutes. But I do want to talk a little bit about how we used uh, dbGaP. And I'm going to divide it into two sections. I'm going to, well, actually, I'm going to divide it into three sections. I'm going to talk about past, present, and future. So the past is really sort of talking about in terms of the data in. What we in our group have deposited already in dbGaP, and that is nearly 5,000 samples worth. And that's just from my group. Actually, Andy Singleton, who's also in the lab, and, and Sonia Schultz, who's also in the lab, they've deposited even more, much more, in fact, uh, because Parkinson's disease is more common. Um, but that data alone has been requested and downloaded about 297 times. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal. Now, it, do, it pales in comparison to CIDR, but I think we're more focused in our, in our purview than, than CIDR is. Uh, but we were also among one of the first data sets to be deposited there. And I think that that's something that we, we've really harped on and really sort of used to leverage our approach to, to data. Because when we put this data up and when we publish it, we do not put an embargo on it. We just put it out there and it's there. Um, you know, we want people to use it. We view this as a public resource and something that the community should use to increase the power of their own study. In terms of data out, and this is kind of the present, right now, I've downloaded about 44,000 controls from dbGaP, and I'm using those in our, in our, uh, in our GWAS. And that has been uh, both a very rewarding thing, because it's really increased our power, but it's also been quite technically difficult and quite, quite challenging to deal with all of that data. But it's done, and it's really paid off and paid dividends for us. Now, that's sort of the, the past and the present. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the future and end with this. And this is our large uh, genome seek project that we've recently been funded for. Oh yes, you told me you were going to stand up as I was running out of time. Now I remember. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to keep. I'm going to edge over here, and I'm going to bring this over there. Um, so we're funded through congressional funds for to, to genome sequence 3,000 cases of FTG, 3,000 cases of Daventio and Lewy body, and about 2,000 controls. And we're going to do all of our analysis on Google Cloud, as you would well expect, because really getting, you know, this is a large data set. And, and, and now we're, and then one of the things, and the reason why I think they, they actually gave us the money is because what we said is, look, we're going to use this for scientific purposes. Yeah, for sure. We're going to do gene discovery and, and mapping, fine mapping of, of existing known loci. But much more importantly, we're going to make this data publicly available as a public resource so that others can download it around the world, incorporate it into their own data, and really sort of kickstart gene discovery in, in uh, these other types of dementia diseases. Um, we're going to put it up onto EGA, and we're going to put it up onto Google. Now, there are advantages to putting it up onto Google if somebody wants to ask me about that at the end. We're going to do that without embargo and prior to publication, right? We really are. I would love to put this up on dbGaP. I know that there are problems, and the key problem is that what's highlighted right there, the size of these data sets, 1.6 petabytes. Now, I mean, I, to be fair, I know that dbGaP has kind of come in for a little bit of criticism because they've been uh, sort of not accepting much more new data. But to be fair, that's a big amount of data. I mean, you can't, you can't blame them when, when, you, when you look at those sizes. Um, but I do think that it highlights one of the things that we have to address in the future for dbGaP, and I'm trying to set the stage here to make your case so that you can ask for more money, is that really dbGaP has to be funded to store all of these larger pieces of data. And, and this, is gonna, this is gonna keep coming, and this is, that's, that's only a small portion. I'm, I'm sure that the AG sequencing project is gonna have to have even more. I'll stop there before he pushes me off the, off the, <laughs> off the thing. I am Irish. I will keep talking until I am kicked off. That, that is true. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions. All right. Any questions? All right. So yeah, if you have, uh, if you have, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Mike is going to say a few final words, but. Uh, you know, if you have questions about the, the future of dbGaP, you know, catch up with Dina or uh, Kim Pruitt or, or Mike Fiolo, uh, you know, sort of uh, with a piece of cake in the back uh, at the end, and, and they'll probably be happy to tell you about the future. <laughs> okay. I think the last thing I want to do is thank the speakers, especially
especially those of you who traveled here, but everybody, really. Thank you very much. That was great. I, I really enjoyed that. And let's eat some cake and celebrate. Thank you. Thank you.